on behalf of the Department of Sociology, Maulana Ajad National Urdu University, I welcome the students of Sociology, Directorate of Distance Education to, the, to this program today on diversity in Indian society. We have Professor M. A. Kalam to discuss on this topic today. M. A. Kalam has been a well-known sociologist come anthropologist. He has been retired from the Department of Sociology, Madras University, Chennai. After that, he served as the Professor of Eminence in Tejpur Central University, Assam. Sir, we have been facing difficulties with regard to you know, diversity in the society of India. I would like to ask you a few questions about relating to diversity and how do we understand about so, the diversity in the Indian society and all. So, what could be a common understanding of, sociological understanding of the concept of diversity? Basically, when you talk about diversity, what you are trying to show is that there is no uniform kind of a society, there is no homogeneous society. So, every society, whether you take up at the national level or you talk about India as such, or you take it up at the regional level, state level or even at the village level, there is no such thing which can be talked about as a homogeneous kind of a society. Every place you have divisions in a society and that gives rise to what is known as heterogeneity. And that is what we are talking about diversity that any community you take up or uh, any society you take up or a village that you take up, it shows that there are divisions, there are groups of people who are different from each other and uh, they have their own practices. So, different kinds of practices in terms of they might be speaking a different language, they may have different religions, they may have different food habits or they may have uh, different clothing patterns and costumes and other customs and traditions. So, when you find that people are not uniform, people are not homogeneous and they have divisions within them and they show that they are different from each other, that is when we talk about diversity. And therefore, at all levels you find, say for instance, you talk about India, then you have different kinds of diversity. India has 29 states, it has got union territories, each state has got some kind of a peculiarity. And in 1956, if you go back and look at the state reorganization, the country was divided into linguistic states. Yes. And prior to that, we had what is known as uh, a slightly different kind of division in the country where the British had what is known as Madras Presidency, Bombay Presidency and Calcutta Presidency. Yes. And this was till 1947, but it continued up to 1956. And 1956, because of the SRC or the State Reorganization Commission, which was set up, we found that India could be divided into different kinds of states okay. and those were those states were based on okay. language. So, oh. there were no linguistic division of the country which took place. Yes. Can you also explain to our students, what do we understand about social diversity? Yeah, social diversity is in terms of how you can have differences because of your practices, so, social yes. practices which are there. And also you can have a different kind of diversity for economic diversity. Economic diversity would mean that you have people who are divided according to the kind of uh, income that they have or the earning or the, as different classes. Therefore, you can have upper class, then you can have a middle class, then you can have a, a lower class and within that you can also make further kind of divisions. So, that would be economic diversity that you are dividing people on the basis of uh, strength that the people have. But social diversity would mean uh, that the society can be divided into the social practices which are there among the people. So, any, any social aspect that you take up for instance, and that can be different from one community to another, one society to another, one group to another. That is when you talk about social diversity. And religious diversity would be for instance, when you talk about different groups of people who follow different kinds of religions and India is full of uh, religious diversity which is there. Therefore, uh, at one level you can talk about diversity per se, which means that you are talking about differences. And then what kind of differences are there, what kinds of practices are there among the people can be further subdivided. That is when you can bring in social diversity as opposed to say for instance economic diversity, linguistic diversity or uh, even religious diversity. So, this is the kind of division which can take place at different levels. Social diversity is one of the ways in which you can have people are placed at different levels because of the fact that they are socially different from each other. Why do we need to study and examine diversities in Indian context? Yeah, that is a good question. We need to study diversity because we have to show that 
pe people are made of different kinds of uh, uh, groups and therefore uh, there is no need to homogenize them or try to say that it's all one kind of a group of people who are there and uh, which would mean that you try to hide the differences which are there amongst people by putting them just into one kind of a block and that kind of a thing does not exist whatever places wherever you go india of course shows the highest amount of diversity compared to any other countries but it is also necessary to uh, uh, lay emphasis on the fact that people are different and they are diverse so it's necessary to show it because otherwise there can be uh, practices whereby you try to say, show that there's a homogenizing kind of an effect which is there or you talk about just one kind of a single thing where you talk about as the mainstream so in order to avoid those kind of arguments in order to avoid those kinds of practices which talk about homogenization or which talk about only mainstreaming of the society mm -hmm. is necessary to study and show that diversity exists so the best way of doing this kind of studies is through empirical studies which you take up in a particular area or a locality or a village or a township for instance and you try to show through your studies empirically by getting first hand data from the communities or the groups of people you are studying that diversity exists amongst them and it's not only social important also it's important from the point of view of politics for instance so one kind of politics that uh, that can exist is when you say that uh, in some way you say that we are all one the fine at one level it's all right but that's not good if you're trying to mainstream and show that there's a homogenization effect which happens so in order not to fall into the trap of homogenization and mainstreaming it's necessary that you recognize diversity and you do it through proper kinds of studies rather than just doing it in an armchair basis or just doing it without proper kind of a data okay. so it's good to have a study done whereby you can show that diversity exists can you also highlight the differences amongst the communities in india and why do they exist at all the differences have come about amongst communities because either they have had uh, been living in different places or because they have followed different kinds of practices okay. or the social socio economic level at which they existed must have been different and therefore you take up any community for instance uh, whether you take up uh, among the hindus or you take up among the muslims or the sikhs or the christians there's no just single group like muslims or hindus or something the, all of them can be subdivided and you find that there there are different groups among them if you just want to take up among the muslims one of the divisions at the macro level could be between the shias and the sunnis okay. but then besides this kind of a division which could be there at the higher macro level between the shias and sunnis you, you, among the sunnis itself you can have different kinds of groups which are of there course. okay and most of india for instance if you take up uh, hyderabad itself you have different kinds of people who recognize themselves there's a self definition somebody may say that i am a pathan somebody may say that i am a sheikh and somebody might say that i am a sayyid now this kind of divisions can be there and this is just to talk about one community among the muslims so if you take up sikhs for instance there there can be different kinds of sikhs which are there and incidentally which most people do not know is that punjab has the highest amount of uh, diversity in terms of uh, say within the community having a group uh, as diverse uh, on the one hand you can have sikhs on the other hand uh, it's the highest uh, number of uh, or the percentage of dalits in the country are in punjab yes about 33% or right. 32 yes. to 33% okay yeah. normally you would not think that among the sikhs there could be dalits oh, yes but constitutionally initially of course it was recognized that among the hindus there can be dalits okay. uh, at that time of course the word which was used was scheduled castes okay among um, and constitution also at that time recognized the fact that among the sikhs also there can be scheduled castes later among the buddhists for instance the buddhists were recognized as a separate kind of a group okay. and they are also included as among the buddhists the schedule caste which are there okay. therefore when we are talking about differences among communities you and the brahmins for instance if you take up show diversity to yeah. take up an example from say tamil nadu for instance uh, though they call themselves brahmins at one macro level you have just to give one one single division among them uh, which is highly recognized and all of them self define themselves either this or that 
is the Shaivite and the Vaishnavite, that is the Ayars and the Ayangars. Okay. Okay. And uh, if you take up the Dalits, for instance, okay. in Tamil Nadu, we have different groups of Dalits. The yes. Pallars are there, the Parayars are there, and the Chikalayars are there. And in Andhra and Th Telangana itself, you have the Malas and the Madigas who are well known. Yes. Therefore, to my mind, uh, if you take up any large group of people, you will always find that there are divisions amongst them. If okay. the group is large enough. Okay. Okay. And at the most micro level, maybe you will not find, say for instance, if you go to the family level or level of one small community as a kinship group or something, you may not find diversity. But then beyond that level, beyond a level of a kinship, even among Muslims, for instance, uh, you will find that there are differences. Okay. And therefore, uh, there is no community, I would say, uh, which is there at a macro level where you can say that there is no no difference among these group of people. They're just single homogeneous kind of a group. Okay. That kind of a thing does not obtain okay. here. Therefore, right. always you find uh, amongst most, uh, unless somebody can say at the cost of disagreeing with me uh, by saying that, okay, there is this group which is large and is in thousands and then there's no diversity, which does not happen normally. Okay. You always find that uh, a group has got diversity. How does a student, a student of sociology approach diversities, differences, inequality and exclusion in relation to Indian society. Yeah, Indian society is famous. Indian society for, today yeah. with reference to today's Indian society. Yeah, so if, uh, Indian society you find that okay, diversity is not very difficult to understand. Okay, then the question of inequality which comes in is something which happens uh, for different reasons, okay. And then uh, the other one you're talking about is exclusion. Okay, all these things, fortunately or unfortunately, have been features of Indian society. Indian society has got diversity, okay. and because Indian society has diversity, there could be economic differences amongst the, within the same group. Therefore, you will have some kind of inequality amongst them. And then those who are unequal for mm. some reason or the other mm. try to discriminate against each other and mm. try to exclude each other. So these are features which happen in all places. Okay. Uh, the attempt of sociology students or students from anthropology should be to understand as to why it happens. Okay. And if there are any ways in which you can make recommendations which could be taken up as policy recommendations for re reducing these things. But that's not a very easy thing. Uh, most often you just see that uh, most of the studies which are done are done in terms of what is happening. And then you say that these are the kind of inequalities, this is the kind of discrimination, or this is the kind of exclusion which exists among these groups of people. We sometimes fall short of making recommendations or do not recommend at all okay. as to what could be done. And also it's not easy uh, after doing a study that uh, you can always have policy recommendations. Sometimes you can do that. Okay. Uh, in certain cases where some, some things have occurred and you investigate as to why, uh, what was the trigger point and uh, what was the thing which brought in, say for instance, uh, problems between two communities and how those kind of problems in terms of inequality, discrimination, exclusion can be reduced. It's possible sometimes, okay. it may not be always, but uh, the aim should be to recognize why certain things happen uh, in all these spheres, for instance, inequality, discrimination, exclusion, and then if it can be remedied in some way. Okay, okay. so it's possible to do that in certain cases and uh, social scientists should try to attempt to do that. Do you think sociology is more Eurocentric when analyzing the relationship with the evolution of society? Yes. Indian uh, sociology particularly in terms of Indian sociology. Yes, because of the way sociology was brought into the country during the colonial rule. Uh, some of the theories and the others which have been used extensively have had uh, a Eurocentric kind of an approach which has been there okay. and uh, it is an inevitable kind of a thing which has happened. On the one hand that was uh, one of the things in which uh, some Eurocentric kind of practices came up in terms of the following of sociology or in terms of studying sociology using framework or theoretical kind of orientation of one kind. But subsequently it's also so happened that most of the people who had access to a subject like sociology came from the upper castes and upper classes. Okay. So they brought in their own bias again in terms of 
the study of sociology okay. and therefore uh, the value neutrality to an extent is not always po possible to be completely neutral and completely objective. Some amount of subjectivity uh, will always come in. Uh, uh, so, our social sciences have suffered because of the approach of certain people in the beginning, the so called founding fathers or whatever term you would like to use, whereby these people have uh, tried to show uh, a bias in favor of the upper castes or the upper classes in terms of their conception of a society and in terms of how to write the things. Uh, some of the younger scholars are trying to undo that by having a different kind of an approach. For instance, uh, last two days we had a seminar in your own department mm -hmm. where we're yeah. trying to find out as to how a scholar during the 16th century, uh, 14th century, yeah. Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Khaldun. Ibn Khaldun yes. had talked about uh, many of the things which the sociologists are doing today. Yeah. And uh, though Auguste Comte uh, in the French tradition is considered, was a positivist, considered as a founding father of sociology. Now scholars are questioning that and think that some of the theories propounded by and some of the things which were put forth by Ibn Khaldun yes. are very relevant even to this day. Yes. And uh, his approach to many things, yeah. including things on environment for instance, uh, are being uh, re-studied and uh, one problem has been that good translation of his work has not been available. Of course. And uh, because English and French uh, uh, language uh, texts and books were very easy to access, therefore most of the people have just followed that. Yes. And now many historians, economists and also ecologists have started looking at the work of Ibn Khaldun and they feel that uh, he is highly relevant. Yes. And uh, also one of the things which you are talk talking about was uh, the frontier societies. Yes. And uh, of late uh, frontier studies and the literature and frontier studies has increased a lot. Yeah. And uh, what he was trying to show in the frontier studies was that there are sedentary societies which have settled down uh, to a settled kind of a life. They don't move around. Uh, as much as the, uh, the other group of people whom, whom he calls as the nomadic or the unsettled societies are there. And he talks about the sedentary, sedentary societies as the ones who have got a civilization, but then goes further in terms of what happens to civilization. Now many of the people who are doing frontier studies today follow almost everything that Ibn Khaldun was talking about. 600 years back. Yes. Only thing is that uh, some of them may acknowledge, some of them may not acknowledge. Yeah. But it's also possible that the ideas are parallel or uh, diff different ideas have come in, more or less similar to what he was talking about. And sometimes it's possible that these scholars may not have had uh, the advantage of the translated work of Ibn Khaldun. So it's also necessary going by this kind of an argument that if good translations uh, are available, people can compare the sociology which comes from the West or Europe, Eurocentric sociology with the sociology which existed or history, or history historiography, dem demography or environmental understanding which Ibn Khaldun had about 600 years back. So, we can say sociology has become highly Western oriented or Indological? In uh, on the one hand Western oriented to yeah. start with. So and then the uh, the Indian sociologists have also given a different kind of a color by adopting a upper caste, upper class kind of an approach to that so and not giving much to this. For so instance, uh, one of the person was pointing out as to how uh, with about 8% of uh, the, the tribal societies being only about 8%, anthropologists have almost completely concentrated on those 8%. Okay. They have not given much attention to say, for instance, the 13% Muslims who are there or the 16 to 18% Dalits who are there in the country. The same amount of uh, emphasis has not been there okay. for whatever reason. Yeah. But tribal societies on the one hand have been studied because they are away from the caste society and anthropologists were supposed to take care of that and sociologists have studied caste and uh, but of course only from the top down kind of an approach which was there okay. uh, not looking at from the point of view of uh, people who are at a lower level or sociology from the lower levels including minorities has not been uh, given so much of importance while studying caste. Therefore, some of these people who are pioneers of uh, studies in Indian sociology uh, today will have to be apologetic about the kind of work that they have done earlier without concentrating much on the other kinds of aspects which have which could also have been studied. Okay. Sir, finally, 
please tell our audience about diversity index which was the committee appointed by the central government of india uh, of which i believe professor kundu was the chairman and you are also the member of that committee y yes please tell us something about yeah, this, this was diversity uh, index. this was diversity index commission or a high level committee to study diversity index and recommend uh, make some recommendations was done in the wake of the sachar committee report which came out in 2007 sachar committee had said that you can have diversity without having proper real kind of diversity for instance you can say that there are so much so much of percentage of a quota is there for a particular community and then you can fill up that quota by by bringing people from that community but then you can do it instead of four five communities which might be there in terms of a diversity you may just fill up with one say for instance if you take up uh, a muslim community and if there are four or five groups among the muslims you can just fill in one group amongst them and you can have the target achieved but the others are neglected so diversity does not take place and if you look at the indian society for instance if there are uh, uh, jobs or seats which are available uh, according to the proportion of the people in the, in the country can we have that kind of diversity so there were different aspects which were uh, brought into this uh, this was set up by the minorities uh, ministry of minority affairs when uh, Mr. Yair Antule was the minister for minority affairs, mm -hmm. and the report is there. Uh, it is also available on the uh, website of the minorities ministry of minority affairs. And the idea was to show that diversity is a more complex kind of a thing, and if possible, can we develop an index in that? And then how is it that uh, you can always say that you have met the diversity index, but still not follow all kinds of things which are there? by just neglecting one community for instance take up four uh, three groups of dalits from tamil nadu you have the pallars you have the parayars and you have the chekaliars and you say that okay the dalit quota is x and you fill up all from just one of them and not from all three okay so yeah. that's the kind yes. of thing which is necessary at the more micro level okay. where you can talk about diversity by having uh, giving all um, a proper kind of an importance to different groups which are there rather than just uh filling up the thing by one kind of a thing this can happen very easily but what we can observe is that we are seeing more of debates and discussions with regard to diversity among muslims in india yes what is it? can you explain yeah there this? are yeah. Uh, there are diverse uh, city among muslims in india but one of the questions which comes up uh, uh, quite often is whether muslims have castes okay, okay. to my mind that's not a very good question to have because when you talk about caste you have to just define or take up for consideration what are the parameters of caste are you talking about yes. are you talking about untouchability are you talking about commensality are you talking about purity or are you talking about pollution yes. so if you if you can show me groups of people who are there and show that these are the people who have practice untouchability yes. or there is no commensality or interdining amongst them or they follow the aspect of purity and pollution and then you can say that it's possible that because of these caste features appearing or acceptance of food from somebody or not if these features appear or, or then you can say that there is a caste like structure which is there but the problem with people who talk about caste among the muslims is that you don't have empirical ground level data on the basis of which you can claim that caste like structure exists people say that okay there are sheikhs there are sayyids pathans moguls whatever different division there are caste mm. but to my mind we that's not way to be proper way to go about it they are sects the, yes they are yes. sects they are separate groups okay okay but then in order to make those as castes yep. you have to show that they discriminate against each other okay. they don't have commensality yeah. they don't intermarry and there are so many places where a sheikh marries a sayyid a sayyid marries a pathan a pathan marries somebody else yes and the class factor may come in whereby a rich pathan may like to give his daughter only to a rich sheikh yeah. or to a rich sayyid that's a different matter altogether yeah. you you do say that i will give it only to this person but that may operate on a class basis yeah, this is against the principle of hierarchy as it exists in caste system yes there's no hierarchy yeah. here there's no stratification which is there yes. and therefore uh, if you go to the mosque for instance anybody who goes first can stand in 
the know, first uh, first line or the know, first yes. cue okay and you have to touch your shoulder as well as your toe with the person standing next to you yes. so the whole concept of untouchability itself goes off there okay. all right so equality is established so unless you have specific ways in which you can show that there is discrimination there is hierarchy and there is some kind of an exclusion unless you show that there is no way in which you can argue that caste system operates therefore before you talk about the caste system what is necessary is to show is that these are the features of caste and these are the features which appear or mm. exist among them and oh, for okay. that we don't have ground level specific kind of empirical studies to argue this people just talk about it in the air there is there is no data whether you are talking about Bihar or you are talking about Ashraf Ajlaf question you sometimes bring in but then who is talking about it whether the, you as a sociologist talking about it or people are making the differentiation between themselves by showing some kind of a self yes. definition yes. and even if the self definition is there a Qureshi for instance who is supposed to be a butcher does he sit and eat with another person or not yes so that's the question a rich Qureshi would like to give his daughter to anybody who is an IS officer because of so many reasons yes. okay so where does the question of discrimination untouchability acceptance of food uh, or hierarchy or stratification come in unless you show those features you cannot talk about a caste system okay how do we understand the violence kind of thing going on in Indian society in the name of diversity these days can you be more specific like what we are saying the Indian society is diversified so you you go with your culture I go with my culture yeah. but there is a tendency trying to impose on the uh, groups of the society yes. that you should do this you should not do this yes how do no. we understand this no. aspect of diversity no th that's something which comes in as a kind of a mainstreaming practice okay. for instance if you say that i don't recognize your culture i don't recognize your way of doing things then that's a wrong approach to have and that's where people were trying to bring homogenization or mainstreaming by saying that people do not have space for their own practices or their own culture and if real diversity has to be there it should work towards what is known as pluralism okay diversity is not pluralism diversity is something which exists pluralism is something which should be obtained and okay. pluralism means that in a society there is space for people to have different kinds of practices okay. which the state does not try to stop and where there is no distinction in terms of one person trying to impose something on the other that's pluralism so from diversity we should move towards pluralism which okay. is not happening in the country and if pluralism is to be recognized pluralism is to be given space then this whole thing about my food habit should be equal to yours or your food habit cannot be different from mine your dress pattern cannot be different from mine all those aspects should go okay uh, on the you. one hand you are not describing or not recognizing diversity okay. which means you are not uh, giving any importance to pluralism I am sure this discussion today on diversity in Indian society will benefit our students of sociology who are learning the courses through distance mode as well as regular mode as to what diversity is and how do we understand diversity in Indian, Indian scenario existing today. What are the different dimensions of uh, you know diversity in India and also we have discussed about diversity index commission that was appointed by the UPA government in the past wherein professor Kundu was appointed as the chairman of this diversity commission and professor M. A. Kalam was also a member of this commission. Uh, I am sure this will, this will enhance the capabilities of our students of distance education on sociology particularly and diversity in India in particular. For more details on diversity in Indian society please contact us. Thank, Thank you, you for coming to this uh, studio and uh, giving your uh, valuable discuss participating in the discussion today on the uh, topic of diversity in Indian, Indian society. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. much.